Hey, hello. How are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. It's a little bit of everything. It's it's a little bit of event planning. It's a little bit of marketing. It's a little bit of modeling. It's a little bit of this. It's a little bit of that. And it's just like, where can you find the information for this? And that's why I started Park Ave. Artists are just, they're way more responsible. So it is stressful, but it's also not a competition anymore because every artist has the opportunity to be heard. And so I think for the first time, artists can really help each other. It was a, it was a roller coaster for sure. And it, it really opened my eyes to a whole different side of the world that I just had no idea about. I was so sheltered and thought everything was, was so easy. You know, everything was so easy up until that point in my life. I love singing and I didn't know that it would necessarily be a profession. Of course, when I was younger, it was always a dream, you know, and it just kind of kept coming back up. And at some point you have to ask yourself, what is actually stopping me from doing this? What is in the way? If it's just me, then I can get the hell out of the way and I can do this. Hi there, this is Fei Wu. I'm the host for Face World Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, I'm very excited because it's been a while since we last released an interview format podcast. We've been so busy working the docu-series and just wait and see in a couple of minutes, I will let you know a gift we have prepared for you that you get to watch and witness right away. Before that, I want to introduce you to our guest today, Scarlett Park, who is a singer and songwriter. Originally from Seattle, Washington, Scarlett was introduced to me through my audio producer and also docuseries editor, Herman. Immediately after listening to her songs on Spotify, I knew I wanted her on the Face World podcast. Why? Scarlett approaches music not only as a musician, but as a businesswoman, making music a sustainable career. Scarlett is a dark and seductive vocal powerhouse that blends the world of blues and pop. Her voice says a million words without you meeting her in person. I still enjoy listening to Amy Winehouse and I couldn't help comparing the two. Scarlett doesn't have a degree in business or marketing. Instead, she learned everything in the real world. Her childhood wasn't easy. When she was 17, her parents split and she had to take care of her younger siblings and raise them as an adult. Music had always been part of her life, but it was in that moment she realized what it means to be saved and embraced by music. You may have noticed a number of other musicians appeared on Face World, including Irini Tornasaki from Greece, Aiming Wei from Holland, Jesse Mock from LA, just to name a few. Although music has never been my profession, I've come a long way from being a listener, an occasional karaoke fan, to relying on music as part of my career and business, as a podcaster, a docuseries filmmaker. Music is everywhere, and it makes our stories come alive, audio or video. Our listeners, well, that's you, have highly requested interviews with creative people in fields such as art and music to share their stories. How do you do what you love and love what you do? We found Scarlett to be a wonderful example. In this episode, you will learn how Scarlett transferred her knowledge from one arena to another. She acquired skills in a previous industry completely unrelated to music to start Park Avenue, a community for musicians in Seattle. Hey, before we get started, as I promised earlier, there's a little gift I prepared for you. Our docu-series is still in post-production. I can't wait to share it with you. 
Before then, we have a pre-release ready for you to check out. Simply visit faceworld.com, F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D, top of the browser. You will notice a bar where you can enter your email and watch the pre-release, the entire episode, number one. Without further ado, please welcome Scarlett Park to the Phase World podcast. I will see you at the end of the show. How did you meet uh, Herman via Instagram? How, how did that go? I, you know, I guess he found me like on the discover page. Um, I like a year ago, I started really diving into social media and branding and marketing and kind of discovering myself as, um, more of an established business. Um, not just, you know, a local singer to Seattle. I really wanted to try and reach like outside of my little circle. And he somehow found me through some sort of magic. And, uh, he reached out to me and said, I listened to your music. I really liked it. And I would like to link up with you and, and send you a song. And I work with this artist named Tarek and, you know, maybe there's a collaboration in there. And I was stoked because I had just released my very first EP. Yeah. And he sent me the beat and, you know, a year, a year later, I just got back from meeting him and shooting a music video in Barcelona. (laughs) Wow. That's incredible. Uh, Did you guys, I mean, when I think about making things happen, uh, how, how long did it take between, okay, this is an idea to, okay, let's book some hotels and buy some plane tickets. Yeah. Well, okay. So it all kind of worked like super coincidentally. Like I, it was just one of those situations where everything kind of fell into place in the craziest way some call it luck, some call it God, but you know, either way it was super awesome. And so basically he sent me the song a year ago, you know, I wrote something, sent it back to him a couple months later. Um, we do kind of the back and forth, back and forth for a little bit. And, you know, eight, maybe seven months, eight months later, uh, I hear back from him and he said, Hey, the people that are kind of funding this project really like, the song and we want to do a music video for it. And I'm thinking like, okay, like you guys, you know, they're going to come to Seattle or, or whatever. By this time I had just, um, I had started dating my current boyfriend, Marco, who is just everything. He's so great. He's a professional videographer. We met while he was filming me performing and we both just have this like fiery passion for like creating. And Herman was like, yeah, I've been following you. And actually your boyfriend is an amazing videographer and we want to hire him to film the music video. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> That's so crazy. Like how, how insane that that like worked out like that. And yeah, everything fell together and we, we went two weeks early and then we met uh, Tarek and we have our song one more. It was just crazy. It was just a fabulous experience all the way around. Yeah. Speaking of which, you're the talent, right, in this project, but also related to what you do for other artists, because bringing that and creating that community is really key to making sure that everyone can be not just successful, but everyone has a chance to share their voices. And especially, I think, for independent artists, people who aren't artists don't realize how much work that goes into their everyday lives. So if you don't mind, I'm going to jump and ask you about your idea behind Park Avenue. And for people, for listeners who have never heard of it, like what is Park Avenue? Uh, Park Avenue was created when I threw out my back and was unable to walk. And I am such a social person that it really made me dig deep and think of like, I, you know, I wish there was a way if somebody's unable, whether it's like social anxiety or they're actually, you know, physically crippled to get out and still find information and be connected to the scene in Seattle. Even if you do go out, you're never able to reach every show. You're never, you know, able to reach every artist that you want to meet. Like every day I'm learning of a new artist around the city. And networking is really imperative to 
being any type of artist, any type of business, really, you know, I mean, life is networking, but very, very, very much so in the music industry, because the music industry is still running off of person to person referrals. I mean, it is very stone age. So we're just now passing into this new era of Instagram and Twitter. And, you know, these things have been around for a couple of years, but now that we're kind of over the the flash effect of them, people are starting to realize what great tools they are for business. And, you know, I personally view my Instagram as a visual resume instead of just, you know, a fun place to like, look what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's, you can now, uh, you can now connect with people from all over the world, which did happen, you know? So I just really wanted to share what I had learned because I have done it all myself. And it was kind of a nightmare learning everything myself. Like, I mean, there's just so much, there's so much, and there's not, it's not something that you can really learn in a school. Like, even if you go to school for music, you're getting taught about the the mathematics of music. You're getting taught how to teach music to other people. You're not getting any real life experience on how to go to a show, set up, you know, network with people, the proper introductions to make to people how to find a good producer, what what you're looking for in a studio, how to market yourself properly. I mean, it's a little bit of everything. It's, It's a little bit of event planning. It's a little bit of marketing. It's a little bit of modeling. It's a little bit of this. It's a little bit of that. And it's just like, gosh, like where can you find the information for this? And that's why I started Park Ave because I really, really would love it to become, you know, after time and and content and and people really participating, the go-to place for an artist to find what they're looking for by somebody who's done it. Um, Not just, you know, going to a seminar by, no offense, some guy who was famous in the 80s. It's like, that's that's not applicable anymore. It's just not, you know, like artists can now self-release their music on multiple platforms. They, you know, artists are just they're way more responsible. So it is stressful, but it also, it's also not a competition anymore because every artist has the opportunity to be heard. And so I think for the first time, artists can really help each other. Wow. There's no better way to say that. And we are seeing that now through every industry, whether it's, uh, you know, your modern type of music, jazz music. And I know you have background in opera as well. Um, but I, as a podcaster, I'm, you know, I've built my own community a year ago. I, at some point I thought, oh, it's a lot of work. Maybe people, you know, I was just telling a client I thought it could exist. It didn't have to. But now the moment I thought I was going to quit that, the members from the group is like, no, 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 we'll take whatever, we'll do whatever it takes to keep that running. Yeah. So what, what has, you know, what, what has some of your experience been so far? Like the interactions and, you know, I I want you to share the fact and tell people that you don't need, you know, a thousand person tribe to start this thing and to provide value. What was the beginning stage like? Yeah. So the beginning stage, I mean, we're still technically in my eyes, the beginning stage. We just launched in January. Our launch party was, it was pretty popping. You know, I've been, I've been throwing parties around the city for a while. I was a wedding planner for eight years before this. And, um, you know, it was, it was well-received, but totally not what I expected after that. People were really excited to hear about it. And, um, we, you know, we had, of course, an influx of, of people wanting to join the app because it is a membership, like exclusive only, you have to be an active artist and we are kind of cracking down on that a little more too, because we do want it to be a very serious place where people feel safe sharing their quote unquote secrets, like how they did things, you know? So this isn't just for like some random person to come in and, you know, take the thing that you worked really hard to figure out. So, so it's been, it's been, of course, like I think any new business, it's been a little bit of pivoting and figuring out each month we do a social and every month I get feedback from people, you know, this was really great. This not so much, you know, we're, we're now at the point where I think we have the, the framework of what the, the events are going to be. And one thing that I've always really valued was people's feedback at, at, from another artist to me, 
you know, and it's usually kind of an awkward thing because it can come off kind of like bitchy in some cases or judgy, you know, and maybe it's not meant to be that way, but artists are just so sensitive, myself included. Like nobody wants to hear like, yeah, I saw that you tried that dance move, but it just didn't hit, you know, like nobody wants to hear that, but it would, you know, but, but people need to hear that. And in order to grow, you have to get that feedback. And I feel like it would be way better to hear it from another artist than from somebody tweeting about it on Twitter or, you know, if you were just to keep doing this thing and everybody hates it, but nobody's telling you like, what the hell? So our mixers now are, uh, we have a featured hustler and it's like a local artist that is totally killing it. And, you know, different genres or just could be anything. And then we invite, uh, we do an hour and a half of open mic at the beginning and the featured hustler gives every person that performs feedback. Um, like very honest feedback, you know, like, Hey, your lyrics were great. This, you know, maybe work on your rhythm or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so what is the venue like? Because this is a live event where people actually come together and there is live constructive critiques and, you know, what's the size of the venue? How many people do you usually get? Uh, so we do it at a different venue every month because, um, again, one of the biggest parts of Park Ave is integrating into new circles and networking. So I try and do it in a different neighborhood every month at a live music venue. And it's usually on a Sunday or a Monday, which are never booked. And it's really good for artists to attend. Our attendance is usually between 40 and 80, depending on runway of, of how long I had to promote. Like this month I'm running behind because I just got back from the trip and 40 to 80 people. Are they all members? They're, I would say about 75% are members. And then we get about 25% uh, trickle in like from just advertising promotions. And the really cool thing is that a lot of people come back and bring new people. So it seems like it is the idea is working and it is spreading. I do um, my own marketing by going to other open mics and my business cards are just networking cards that on one side say, you know, Park Ave networking for musicians. And on, you flip it over, it says, hey, I heard you're a badass. And so they're meant to just, you know, with no name, it doesn't have my name on it or anything. It's just meant to give to people to like, let them know, hey, you know, do you, you're a badass and you want to be a part of this community of supportive artists. So what is the, I noticed that it, you have the request to join the member space. I love mm -hmm. this process. Because you you will vet people before just anybody, people who are cranky yeah. and don't want to do the work to be part of the community. What is that process like? And then is it, I assume it's somewhat affordable. Like what is the, what is the pricing structure like? Because there's, there's that entrepreneurial aspect. Yeah. Of our so it's actually a free, it's a free community. Um, artists don't have to pay anything and they never will. You know, Park Ave makes money by... Uh, connecting brands with artists and connecting artists with venues. And so we do bookings at specifically right now, we're doing um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights at the Fairmont Hotel in downtown Seattle. And we will be booking music there year round. So that's what uh, kind of supports Park Ave right now. Plus, we'll, you know, we'll be looking to add on some other sponsors that we're working on right now, which is very exciting, like brand sponsorships. Um, you know, whether it's water or alcohol or just being able to connect, you know, hyper local brands with that city's favorite artist to promote their product will help them and the artists reach, you know, new, um, new, new ears, eyes, mouths, <laughs> people. <laughs> wow. That's it. I mean, it's a, in itself, a, a very established consulting service. glad you mentioned that you were a wedding planner for eight years. So yeah. there are your project management skills, event planning skills, which frankly, a lot of people don't have. I worked 12 years as a project manager, but wow. honestly, I don't really know how to plan an event. Like events, live events in particular would drive me nuts. Like mm -hmm. uh, even going to an event, 
to see when the pieces are not connected. But yeah, it's uh, I feel like you know my whole life has just been kind of a puzzle of these random things that I was thrown into that have all finally come together. That's what it feels. This last year has just felt like, okay, I finally know what I want to do, what I'm doing. I never thought I would be there. I was so sick of just work. I'm like, God, I'm like, you know, I've been through this and I've been through that. And like, how are all these things going to connect? You know, I was, I'm a singer and a performer. I'm a wedding planner. I'm a bartender. I'm really into graphic design. I also love marketing and advertising, you know, like I'm like, God, these, these things are all so disjointed and they're not connected. Yeah. It was, it was really, really funny how it all came together. And I, I had no intention of starting a business and it's awesome. I love it. (laughs) I too was in your shoes in a way that I did so many different things. And I'm originally from Beijing, China, yeah. And uh, the path I had always envisioned was working for consulting and I you know, speak the second language that's getting so popular. Uh, like you said, event planning, project management and graphic design, how that fits in is, is instead of spending hundreds and thousands of dollars asking other people to design these banners, and these marketing materials yeah. for you, you're doing it all on your own I and mean, getting mm-hmm. better at it. So Tubi, I I don't know. How do you feel about the fact that people who are multi-trick ponies are that much more likely to ease into entrepreneurship because they are less likely to rely on 18 other people to do what they do? Um, I, yeah, the uh, poly hyphenates actually, I think is the term for it. I would, I wish that everyone could do it. And I wish that every I, I wish that everyone would try to do it and and not um, let themselves get overwhelmed. You know, I so I was this close to just being like, you know what? I'm a good wedding planner. I'm just gonna do this. This is great. I make good money. It's easy. I'm used to it. You know, I have a comfortable job. Like all of that. And I don't know what I honestly don't know what the the turning point was with that. I think it was just the fear of looking back and being like, what if, you know, I tried to do this crazy thing and it, it's like, what if, if it fails, guess what? I'm a great wedding planner. You can always <laughs> go back to your old job. And yeah. So the, even with, for people who don't do it, perhaps, or necessarily interested in everything that we do, you know, marketing and design and project management, yeah. you can still hone in on the skills you have and say, just branch out a little bit or you know, work with a friend who may possess skills that you really need for your new business, there is always a way in. And let's talk about your background a little bit. People may be wondering at this point, tell us about your upbringing. You know, I know that your childhood and your upbringing had a lot to do with who you are and where you are today. Yeah. um, My childhood was, had a great start. (laughs) My mom and dad are, are, fiery couple. I'm the oldest. I was a single child until I was seven. And then, you know, my dad was in the military and everything was very structured. My mom was a great like PTA mom and things really went, you know, I guess pretty normally, quote unquote. I bounced around. I've always like had an interest in a million things. I, you know, one year I was playing soccer. One year I was swimming. The other year I was doing ballet. And the next year I wanted to do basketball and you know so but uh when I was 16 my parents split and it was a night it was like the worst the worst I think divorce ever that I've that I've been around you know having had other friends with their parents that that split it was bad and it really shattered my reality when I was 16 trying to figure out who I was what I wanted to do with my life um you know I had been singing in choirs and church. And I did opera, like, as you mentioned, when I was 12. Uh, How did that come about? I don't think anybody just stepped into opera. Like, (laughs) yeah. I was singing in my choir and, or in my church choir. And the pastor was like, you know, we think that she has a really good voice. She has potential that, but she really needs some training. You know, I was just all over the place. You know, I was a, kind of a hard to wrangle person. I'm a lot calmer now that I'm, you know, a little older and been on my own for a while. But when I was a kid, I was totally a rocket off the walls everywhere. everywhere. So I think that was an attempt to really put some structure into 
into making me take singing more seriously. And I hated it because it was so structured. So many rules with opera, stand up straight, you know, breathe in through here and blah, blah, blah. And we can't wear heel or I don't, I mean, I don't know. It was just, was way too much for me. And the competition was like so stressful. I was like, look, I just like to sing. I don't want to be like memorizing somebody else's lyrics and print You know, I have to pronounce the vowels this way, or I'm going to be docked five points. Like, so that's when I discovered jazz. And, um, I, in high school, I started singing in the jazz choir. And so as I'm like really finding my voice, quote unquote, you know, uh, is when my parents split and I started to really, really dive into writing and trying to cope with what everything that was going on. My dad completely left. My mom fell off the deep end. I had no idea where she was either. And so it was me, um, staying with my sisters and my brother moved up here. And so it was just me and my siblings kind of like fending for ourselves for probably a good six, seven months or a year. Well, so um, on, in that period, you were only 16. So you were not an adult, but you were taking up right. a very adult role trying to raise right. your siblings. Yeah. So I think like by the time we were, you know, it, it, I was uh, about halfway through, or I was at the end of my junior year, about to go into my senior year. And my grades had just plummeted like to the bottom, you know, and my everybody's like, what the hell's going on? You know, everything was great. I was a great, I was like 3.8, 4.0 student. Um, and I was lucky I graduated because my goal was to really try and shelter my sisters from what was going on. They're much younger than me, seven and 10 years younger than me. So they are way younger. Like what's, yeah, what's going on? Why, where's mom? Like, you know, and when we did see my mom and my dad, like they were just, they were drunk or, or high or whatever. And it's just awful. And I'm very open with this because, you know, it, it really did teach me a lot. And I don't think people realize how many people have had things like this happen to them. And I'm, you know, I've talked extensively with my parents about it and, and they know that I'm going to be very open about it, which is actually good that we're finally at that point that, you know, cause for years and years we didn't, I didn't talk to my parents. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I, I definitely felt like I raised myself past 16. I moved out right when I turned 18. I graduated by the grace of God. I wrote a letter to my dean, you know, explaining everything that happened, why I hadn't been in school. And, and they let me graduate on time, which was great. It was a, it was a roller coaster for sure. And it, it really opened my eyes to a whole different side of the world that I just had no idea about. I was so sheltered and thought everything was, was so easy. You know, everything was so easy, um, up until that point in my life. So, you know, what I was thinking is this category that has been thriving on our podcast, which when, whenever we go through transitions and we reflect upon our own lives, it always feels so sheltered. We feel very much alone. And in a way we are alone that we are the only ones with the, our own unique experiences. But at the same time, there's always these many versions of other stories sometimes happening in parallel at that exact same time as we're experiencing all the difficulties. Yeah. You know, a normal 17 year old, 18 year old will be thinking about college, what to major and, um, yeah. but you're trying to survive. Right. And then you're trying to not only survive on your own, but you had much younger siblings to take care of. And to to think about it, to care for, um, what was going through your head at the time when you were, you know, leaving high school? Did you think about college, or did you think about let me get a job and I need to be very real with my situation? Yeah, um, I briefly thought about college. I did go to community college when I was nineteen. I applied for a scholarship and, um, somebody, I was actually, somebody reached out to me and said, you know, you need to keep singing. You should try, you know, you can probably get a scholarship at this college. And, and I did, I got a scholarship for singing, which was great because, you know, I wasn't making, I wasn't going to qualify for financial aid because my dad was in the military. And for some reason there was, there was this just stupid caveat of like, for some reason I wasn't unless my school was getting paid for by somebody else, I wasn't going to be able to go. So I went to school and that kind of helped me get my, my life together because from 18 to 19, I was just, 
I'm, I moved in with some boyfriend and I worked at a call center for Sprint and <laughs> gained a lot of weight and was just like, I just felt, I remember just feeling so hopeless. And um, it was after that, that I broke up with the guy. Thank God he cheated on me. And, you know, I <laughs> was like, I'm out of here. Screw this. And, you know, started hanging out with um, my best friend, Samantha met her and, and she, you know, was kind of going through her like angsty thing too. And it's just crazy how, how things happened. Um, could you maybe take us to the beginning of your new music career where you started to see possibly now it's after the fact as the more pivotal point or the beginning of seeing it as a career and actually you know, inserted effort in kind of Mm -hmm. marching towards that path? Yeah. So after I dated the guy, the drummer, that I really got a taste for what it was like. We played shows all over the place and, and, you know, he really ignited this passion and this, I think I, I never really had faith in myself that I could be a lead singer of anything. You know, I'd love, I'd always sing in these choirs and, you know, I just had never really taken that step. It's, and he really pushed me to do that, which was great. And after we broke up, I was devastated because I I felt like he was the one person that saw what I could do, helped me get there. And when we broke up, I was just shattered. I felt like the dream wasn't going to happen. You know, he was, he was my drummer. This is, you know, kind of classic. Every The band breaks up and everything's over. So it wasn't until I was 23 and... I was going to meet some friends in Seattle for some drinks. And I ran into this, and this girl, Maria, who we had been friends in high school and had some falling out over a guy or something. We used to share lockers in high school. You know, it's been years now and hi, how are you? And, you know, and I leave, don't really think anything of it. And, and then I get a text or a call or something from her that says, you know what? It was great to see you you need to get out of the tiny town that you're living in because you're not going to go anywhere. I'm 23. I'm still living in this shitty town that I'm from, right? And she's like, you know, are you still singing? And I said, no, I gave up on that. It's stupid. Like, I'm over it. And she's like, well, that that just, just doesn't make sense. You just, you should be singing. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm just shit out of luck. I work at a coffee shop. I'm alone. And so she calls me and she's like, you know what? I live in a a one bedroom apartment in downtown Seattle. And I want you to come and live with me and you can, until you find a job, whatever you need. She's like, I, I know that we haven't been friends since high school or whatever, but I really believed in you. And I, I think you, I I really want you to move up to Seattle. And I was just kind of, you know, shove off. I was like, eh, it's like, no, thanks. Like I'm doing fine. Like I don't need your handout help, you know, whatever. I'm kind of stubborn sometimes. <laughs> and I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And then I called her and I, you know, I said, text me your address. And I drove up there with literally two garbage bags of clothes. That's all I had. And that's how I got to Seattle. So tell us, um, give us an idea of uh, how did Seattle change for you? What was the scenery and what was I know it's sometimes really hard to summarize. There is like the physical stuff and there it's what's there structurally. But I think there's a lot of emotional transitions as well um, to what the possibilities. Well, God, for me, it just felt like I had been yanked out of a black hole. Like I didn't know anyone. Nobody knew me as the girl with the fucked up family, you know, like just nobody knew me. And, And in the town that I was, it was you know, it was a very public, dramatic divorce. Like just everybody knew and and everybody saw me fall apart. And I was kind of, I was a mess. I just, everybody knew it. I knew it. And I knew that everyone else knew it. And it was just kind of, you know, I was very ashamed and I, I didn't want to be that person, but I, I didn't have, you know, whatever to, to get out of that and to get out of my own head. And so for me, it was great. It was, it felt like every day was a sunny day. It felt like, you know, I could be whoever I wanted to be. I could wear whatever I wanted to wear. I, 
I could change my name if I wanted to, you know, like it, it was just a very great feeling. And I, and I got hired, um, at two places, like within a couple days, I got hired at the, this bar called the ballroom, which I actually worked there for four years. And, uh, it was amazing. I met, you know, lifelong friends there and it was just exactly what I needed, you know, a complete change of, of atmosphere. And, you know, the, having one person say, you know, I, I think that you should be doing that. I, I think that you, I think that you are, are going to do more with your life and to have it be from somebody that I hadn't talked to in years. That was to me, really shook me to my core. And I, I still think about that all the time, how that was the moment that really changed my entire life. Mm, there are a lot of mo- moments that are huge to us on on our milestone. But uh, when you look at them, there are those micro moments. Sometimes just something could be a word, could be a single sentence somebody mm-hmm. said to you. You know, I, I remember the same thing of a colleague, like a coworker telling me that, mm-hmm. you know, Faye, you have this friend, your friend is making you very unhappy, but you're the happiest person I wow. know. So I don't think you should be friends with that person anymore. And I was really shook my core to realize yeah. that, wow, somebody changed my identity. And it's a part of identity that I'm not only proud of, but it was making everybody else happy. So why should I be miserable just to fit in, right? Um, wow. Exactly like you said, but I absolutely, you know, until this point, you know, I'm stunned by your music. The video, I've been watching you on YouTube, and but I also went to scarletpark.com your website and i believe that's your new single right that's yes and moonlight moonlight so that is beautiful that's been performing Thank really you. well spotify um youtube everywhere could you tell us about the origin of that song how it came about and did you write it too it's so funny yes i i write all of my music and i do um quote unquote co-produce i i help pick all the sounds i don't know how the actual programs work but Um, I write all of the songs with the lyrics, not just lyrics, but music as well. And it's funny that you talk about, you know, having a friend that changes your identity because that's exactly what that song is about. You know, I I get to Seattle continuing the story. I end up falling into this group of people that I think I always wished I was part of this group of people, you know, very cool. Like they dress, everybody's really pretty and they dress nice. And God, it was just such a love hate friendship all the time with this group of people. It was just, sometimes you're having the best time with everyone. The other time it's like just constant drama and back talking and, and backstabbing and just so much stuff that I never thought I'd be a part of. And this whole album, which, uh, the album name is called is flight risk. I actually haven't released the name of it yet, but I'm happy to say it here. So it's called flight risk. And the definition of a flight risk is somebody who is willing to leave any circumstance for a better option. And my whole life, I was called that, you know, post divorce me because I was always moving just, eh, this doesn't feel good. Eh, whatever. Eh. And as I said before, I finally feel like I've arrived at the place that feels good. And it feels like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and this record is just a tribute to all of the, all of the places and things and people that I shouldn't have been around and, but needed to, and you know, how they brought me to where I am. So Moonlight is about this group of people that I was so attached to and and so in love with the idea of, of them that it, it was really hard to walk away. And, and they were really nasty about it and made me feel really crazy for you know, just being myself, you know, there was a breakup involved and they totally like gaslighted me into being the crazy girl. And, and, in doing that, I, I purposely went to the, to the total edge and did insane things. And, uh, there's a song that my actual next song that comes out is called man like you. And it's about this guy who pushed me to the edge of my sanity. And I, went crazy and I broke into his house and, you know, moonlight is about how I confronted those people in their face. And I was like, look at what you, look at what you guys are. Like, do you see 
how toxic this is? Do you see that we were friends for years? And the second that you have to abandon me, you do. Do you see that? And uh, so, you know, I collided with the earth and met my maker in the eyes. Um, I should have turned to go, but I love trouble was that's the chorus of the song. Um, And it's just about, you know, meeting the maker in the eye just means looking, looking them in their face instead of, you know, instead of necessarily taking the high road, I, I tried to level with these people and how sometimes that doesn't work. (laughs) One more drink before I go. It's a beautiful thing to talk about because a lot of people are still in the dark. They don't understand when they call a group of people, my people, what that really entails. And then they they need to feel safe, not just understood, because you could still be with somebody, a very close relationship with someone who doesn't quite fully under get you, understand you. But I think... When you don't feel like that safe environment exists can be very, very toxic or people behave in front of you one way and behind your back the other way. The thing you just like very gently said, oh, yeah, you know, I write my own music, the music and also the lyrics and, you know, uh, no problem. So (laughs) I'm intrigued by self-learners, self-starters and when people think about music, I think the reason for not many more people do music in any way, sing or dance or write music is because they think it takes a professional to do it. And right. maybe true in some cases, but how did you acquire these skills? For one, that you didn't go to some fancy college, right? Mm-hmm. To say somebody gave me the permission or taught me for four years and $250,000 later. How yeah. did you learn all these skills on your own? There are two things that I inherently hate, and that is paying for something that I can do myself and being told that I can't do something. And that is what has led me to everything in my life. I love singing, and I didn't know that it would necessarily be a profession. Of course, when I was younger, it was always a dream, you know, I'm Christina Aguilera or whatever, you know. And, um, but it just kind of kept coming back up. And at some point, you know, you have to ask yourself, what is actually stopping me from doing this? What is in the way? If it's just me, then I can get the hell out of the way and I can do this. And, um, I don't know. I think, like I said before, I'm just very stubborn and it works against me and it works for me. (laughs) And it's a little bit of both. I've always really, really loved music, you know, down to my core. And I started out writing poems because it really helped me sort out my thoughts. I, you know, it's, it feels like my thoughts are just alphabet soup in my head. And then as soon as I get a pen to paper, they, it's, it's like they make sense after I write them. It's the weirdest thing. Like I write down and for me, I'm really focusing on like just one line at a time and it'll come out, you know, like put my head down, shuffle my feet. You'll never get the best of me. You know, like that. I don't know. I don't know where it came from, but it, it goes line by line and it it's more like therapy than it is, you know, sitting down to try and write a song. Mm-hmm. Do you play any instruments? I mean, how do you record the music? I play piano. So I taught myself piano when I was 20. But, you know, I definitely do hire, you know, like, quote unquote, professional. Um, but in my opinion, music is not something that can be taught. It's just not, you know, painting a true masterpiece is not something that is precise. It's some, you know, the, everything about art is the flaws and what, you know, the process of getting there. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, it's interesting when you said that we oftentimes are the ones who are stopping ourselves. And I can think of anyone and everything for it to be the case. As, yeah. as trivial as the, the as this sounds, but removing ourselves and unblocking ourselves are really uh, difficult things to do. And and one of my most recent examples is probably the documentary I'm producing. And I spent most of August thinking to myself, 
in moments where I thought, wow, I didn't know how expensive it's going to be. Well, I didn't realize I'll be uh, how, how much hassle I didn't, mm-hmm. as a project manager, I didn't even, I couldn't even envision or put together 80, 70, 80% of the trouble I'm going through. And then I realized somebody said to me yesterday, if I knew all these things going in, I probably wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. be in the trouble right now. So maybe not knowing everything, I didn't have enough evidence. It's the best way to do it. I mean, really jump, jumping in blindly. It's like, you'll figure it out. You're not going to die. That's the thing. Nope. You're not going to die. And I remember somebody said that to me, are you going to die if you go, are you literally going to die if you do this? And I was like, no. They're like, well, what's the problem? You know, like you're going to figure it out and you might look like an asshole. You might, you know, you might look silly or you might, you know, be embarrassed or what, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen. And, um, until the answer is, well, I could die (laughs) and real, I could real, I could realistically die. Like I, I'm probably just going to keep trying new things. Yeah. I mean, how I think at the very same time, even though my parents uh, didn't go through divorce themselves, I highly encourage them considering, consider that because <laughs> I, I thought they would be much, much happier if they were separated, but they didn't listen to me. Um, oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's for real. But when I was 17, I came to this country by, my, well, by myself and five other kids who were 15 at the wow. time. And think about it when you said embarrassing myself, that's, that's hard for somebody in, in her thirties to do like, Oh, I'm just going to embarrass myself on purpose. But when you're 17, you're speaking a a whole new language, which was not rooted in anything, even Mm -hmm. remotely similar to Chinese. At the time, none of us could tell the difference between I need a sheet on my bed versus I need a shit on my bed because those two words sound identical to us. (laughs) So we've come a long way. We really did. I mean, that's not even... I, so I wanted to ask, as you were talking about music, when you, after you write a piece of music on your napkin, back of the envelope or whatever, and now you got to talk to your, your guitar player, some somebody else who may be playing a different piece or your chorus. Like, how do you communicate that? Do they change part of the music? Do they try to make it better, sassier at certain elements? Yeah. Um, so I write out charts, um, which is basically just the visuals, you know, it's a sheet, just sheet music, um, not to that extent, but I write it out and I also send a demo. I just record a demo on my phone and then I say, you know, here's, here's the chords. It doesn't, with live musicians, they would usually play it different every time. Um, except when I did have like, you know, I did have a solid band for like two years and we, you know, we played everywhere. It was awesome. But I just recently retired my band to pursue pop music. So now I, I write songs and I just send them to my producer and I send him a reference track of what it sounded like with my band, but we're not really trying to recreate everything, you know, to sound like my band more to just have that as like maybe an idea. So it's really interesting because my producer, Jake Crocker, he's amazing. He basically takes my little demo recording and builds an entire song around it. The beat, the all the instruments, like everything. And then, um, and we do our sessions via FaceTime like this. My God. And uh, it's really cool because, you know, he just does his thing and I just have my headphones in and, and, you know, I hear him kind of building up the song and. And, you know, we can say, you know, what if let's, uh, let's add some horns here and, or let's add this or not that. And, uh, we have been having live musicians come in and play because I think, you know, obviously I, I come from very organic sounds and, and so I, I want to have that aspect in there and it's just, it, yeah, it, it always changes anytime that somebody touches it. You know, it's, it's really interesting. You have to, it's all about finding the right people. I mean, it's, it's like a relationship. You know? Absolutely. And I love the progress of trying new things and not calling them mistakes, but improving upon it. I think so many people in, still in the modern day world don't know what mm-hmm. it even feels like. Um, when you work in a full-time job and needing 16 approvals before anything sees the light of day, I mean, mm-hmm. it's really, it, it's, it's a shame. So I can't imagine. Yeah. Who are some of your inspirations? I know we're running a little over time. I'll, I'll close with a couple of questions. You know, honestly, I'm, I'm loving Dua Lipa right now. She is so hot right now. And I just love watching her 
um, her, you know, her Instagram story. She's super candid. And, you know, I'm really loving the artists that are embodying, um, kind of them, themselves as more than just an artist. Um, local artist, Paris Alexa, I think she's going to just blow up. She's, she's awesome. I met her randomly a couple months ago and then we've just stayed connected and hopefully, hopefully one day we'll do a song together. Um, it's always, it's always just like random, like one song that I hear and I am so bad about writing them down. I didn't, re- first of all, I didn't realize how soon, how not so long ago you started Park Avenue. And mm-hmm. I wanted to know where you like to take this thing next. Like what is your vision in the near or far future? Oh, this is something that I think about very, very often. Um, It's hard to say at this point because my music is ramping up uh, pretty quickly. So I'm not sure how much, even if I wanted to, um, how much I could really dedicate if things, you know, go really well with music. Um, If I was doing it full time, um, my plan was and technically still is to partner with alternative high schools and start an internship program. So um, a lot of all, so alternative high schools are schools for students that come from broken homes, are addicted to drugs, um, or have been, you know, are, are teen, teen parents. And I actually connected with a alternative high school last year. And one of the students, her name is Kira, has been interning with me for a year and she gets school credit for it. And I get a free intern and she like helps me completely with park Ave. She's amazing. So my goal would be to kind of continue, continue on by offering more opportunities to the members, but also expanding to other parts of the community, like, um, the schools and, and that sort of thing. That's awesome. That's a, that's a beautiful answer. I totally unexpected, but I'm a, a huge fan of internships. I've started a couple of them on my own, hiring high school students into uh, marketing agencies. Yeah. So yeah, that's wonderful. Well, and it's awesome. It's awesome because like this, these schools are willing to offer credit to these students um, for going in and especially interning with musicians. It's like not something that exists really right now. Like musicians don't really have interns because musicians are poor and can't afford them. And, you know, and, and it, you know, in, in the same kind of parallel, like these alternative students don't have the same opportunities to intern, you know, with those regular, I guess, quote unquote, regular jobs that, you know, maybe would be available to some other um, some other high school students. So it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a cool little like misfit internship, uh, where these students are not only getting to learn, you know, maybe some music tips and stuff, but like we talked about before, um, you know, musicians are wearing all the hats these days. So Kira has learned, you know, how to write a booking email. She's learned how to run sound. She's learned event planning. She's learned, you know, all these kind of different things that go into being an artist um, social media branding and, and all of that. So I really, really, really would love to make that, um, make that happen with Park Ave. Absolutely. And to bridge the gap into the farther future, uh, the, you know, when it comes to money, it's a real issue. But like you said, a lot of these companies, unfortunately, won't consider some of these students as their first choice, right? Oh, you, you have to, and it's crazy. I, I've doubted with a lot of these um, kids, you need travel abroad experience. You need to speak a third language. And it's just crazy. These kids never had the opportunity to do that in the first place. Yeah. Um, but I think maybe down the road, there is that nonprofit or not-for-profit, uh, you can start a foundation of some sort. That's when you can connect with the companies who support your endeavor and, um, just to throw it out there, because then that will resolve the money issue that you will be getting paid for however long you're running the internships. And then the companies do that for one, they're doing good. And for two, you know, in a way that that saves them tax money as well. I almost don't want to say Mm -hmm. this, but the intention is it's it's good. It's a win-win for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for 
for all this. I, I really look forward to seeing you. And, and yeah, no, thank you. I'm sorry it took so yeah, long. Yeah, thank like, you so on, much. Have a great evening. Like, Bye, babe. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Phase Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you are on your mobile phone, just search for Phase Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict, and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.